Are you one of the many people looking to get into cybersecurity and eyeballing that new SOC analyst role? If so, today's episode is for you because I'm going to explain exactly how a SOC works. The data, the tools, the technology, and how it all comes together to form cyber defense for an organization's network. Stick around for that and more today on the 12 Days of Defense. All right, welcome to the 12 Days of Defense. My name is John Hubbard. In this episode, I wanted to cover a little bit more of a conceptual angle of cyber defense and talk about what exactly a security operations center does and some of the data it needs to work with and the architecture that's needed to pull off a, a competent cyber defense. So we're gonna do a little OneNote magic today and I'm gonna do some drawing on my iPad here and we're gonna look at it on the screen and I'm gonna explain what a organization's cyber defense operation needs to look like in terms of the data that it's pulling in and the tools that it's gonna to need to use. So let's get started. So first I drew this basic diagram of a corporate network. And what we're looking at here is more of a logical diagram. Yes, you might not exactly have things connected this way, but these are the big players, right? We have the internet, and on the internet we have good servers, we have users, we have attackers, and we also have cloud services that are owned and used by your organization kind of as part of your network, right? Nearly everyone is using these nowadays, whether it's software as a service or platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, even function as a service, and many other things, uh, containers and things like that. We're going to see more and more uh, cloud adoption as time goes on, and especially during COVID, a lot of things have rushed into a cloud deployment model faster than they might have anyway. So that is a big, big piece of the average corporate network now. On the inside of what we would call our traditional corporate network, inside the perimeter, here are the items that we are working with today. We have, coming from the internet, a couple of different zones of activity. We have user devices. Those user devices up here are connected to a switch. Maybe there's an access point for wireless devices, which is probably gonna honestly be most stuff. We have a firewall that protects those user devices. We have routers connecting it to other zones. Uh, over here, we have an internal servers subnet and we have an externalized services subnet over here. Now here is what can happen and what is supposed to happen. We are generally wanting people to access through this kind of a route, our externalized services, good people going to our company website and stuff like that. That's totally normal traffic. We also want our user devices to be able to go out to any kind of good websites that they're going to need to go out to. We also need our user devices to be able to go over to our internal servers. And so those are all things that we would expect to happen and this is all typical traffic, right? Now the problem comes in when the other things start to happen, like attacks. Attacks will come in a number of different directions. There are attacks from the internet going to your externalized services. There are attacks that are being delivered directly to your endpoint devices. And then there are typically attacks that start within your internal network from a device that's already been compromised and maybe are pivoting around and doing lateral movement. And so something like user devices to internal servers. So we may see attackers going like this and maybe sending a phishing email, right? Plenty of that stuff we see it all day. Trying to draw an envelope, there we go. That phishing email may deliver some kind of Word document with a macro in it like we saw before, and it would allow command and control to occur from one of these user devices back out to the internet. So this is gonna be kind of a bi-directional uh, route of command and control. From there, they could tell a device over here that maybe became compromised. We're gonna circle it in red there. This compromised device could then be used as a jump off point to get to the rest of the internal network. And so from there, maybe these attackers are after a database that you have on a server over here. They're going to do some lateral movement and move from one of these user devices over to one of your internal servers, at which point if they can, they may take this data and then exfiltrate it back out to themselves over the internet like that, right? Now this is what we don't want to happen. Uh, we also don't want our internal servers directly talking to the internet unless they absolutely have to, but this is a very simplified attack, right? The attack comes in, goes to a user device, lateral movement happens to a server, something is stolen from the server, the data is sent back out, and now we have a data breach on our hands. That's one model of attack that is very, very common. 
Um, the other big model of attack is an attack that just approaches one of our externalized services directly. So this is going to be an attacker going directly, trying to attack one of our servers that are available to the internet at large. That's another thing that happens all the time as well. Now, what we need to do as a security operations center is monitor for any of these attacks. We wanna prevent every single attack that we possibly can, and we have firewalls, and we have IPS, and we have AV, and all sorts of tools that help this kind of stuff happen. But we know it's going to happen to some extent. And so what we need to do is then be able to monitor what bypasses some of those prevention capabilities and those controls, and still see the evidence of those attacks that are becoming successful attacks. Now these are multi-stage attacks, so remember, just because that phishing email worked doesn't mean they got what they came for and the attack is over. So as long as we see the attack at some point before the attackers get what they came for, we are still going to be at least partially and mostly successful as a blue team because things don't get really expensive until you have a full on data breach. So what we are going to do is instrument our network so that we can see all sorts of traffic in all of those directions. So here are the typical things that a blue team would need to be able to see. It breaks down into two items. We need one, network traffic. We need to copy all of the bits that are flying over the wires and try to store a full copy of it if we can. And barring that, maybe use something like Zeek that we saw before, or at least an IDS, or at minimum, maybe NetFlow records or flow records of any sort that tell us that that attack is occurring. So. The SOC sitting in the middle here is going to be collecting logs and it's going to be collecting network traffic. So basically every single device that we can get information from, we are trying to collect telemetry from it, right? All of those servers sending in logs. We want our switches, our access points, which are part of our network to also send in traffic and they may send in flow records. So that's one possibility. They may mirror out a full copy of network traffic that's going through it. So I'll just write mirror there. And we could collect from this and this. We're going to get logs from our firewall. We're going to get maybe flow records from our router. We're going to get flow records from our cloud services, right? So even more information is coming in. Flow records coming in maybe as Amazon VPC uh, flow records or Azure uh, uh, NSG flow logs. All of those things can be collected, even if it's not something that's on premise. And you can also do traffic mirroring in the cloud as well. If you are running any kind of software as a service or otherwise, you're also going to be getting logs from these services. So basically, the long and short of it is, you're trying to collect all of the network traffic in any given direction that you can, so that no matter where the attack starts and ends, you are going to be able to see it. And so I should draw that from here as well, right? We have two more connections here, we have logs, we have network traffic. If you think about the attack we saw before, we then take this and we can add additional monitoring and security tools. So we might have an IDS. Maybe the IDS takes a copy of traffic here and just starts sampling it and it looks for any attacks. And that kind of IDS may be attached here. Looking at all the traffic coming in, it may be uh, covering just the externalized services or the internal servers. Ideally, it's covering everywhere, right? And so if we consider our attacks before, these are going to cross a number of different locations. If an attack comes in from the internet, for example, and command and control starts between a user device and an attacker after a phishing email, what we're hopefully going to see is that that email came in from our maybe our cloud-based email. If you have Microsoft 365-based email, you're going to get some logs from your cloud email service that say, hey, John might have just received a malicious email. From there, the user clicks on the email and then this red line is going to be traffic going back out to the internet. That traffic is going to start up from a process that is running on the user's device. So a process creation log will be sent to the SOC. Uh, we will have the switch seeing the traffic. It can get NetFlow logs. It can get mirrors of that entire traffic. Your IDS might see it, your firewall might see it, your router might see it, and then any other devices you have along this entire path could potentially catch it as well. 
and then that same attack. We're going from here over to one of these devices. Well, now you can see all of the multiple different points of uh, visibility that you may be able to spot that attack with. And so the idea here is as many places as you can monitor, you want to monitor all those places. Uh, that gives you the best chance as a blue team of catching one of these styles of attack. And that's what we're looking to do, catch any given attack no matter where it starts or where it ends. Now, one of the other things we're going to then consider is what does a sock more internally collect and what is it looking at? We have this drawing here, which is an alternative one, more focused on the actual sock itself. I have a condensed version of the network over on the right side. From the network, what we're going to be doing then is taking logs, taking network traffic. So again, we have logs coming in here from our servers, from our user devices. Uh, we may have firewall logs coming in. We may have traffic capture that is occurring from something like a tap. That network tap is basically just making an entire copy of the traffic. And from an entire copy of the traffic, you can give that to an IDS, you can give it to a full packet capture device, anything that is interested in looking at what's going over the wire as opposed to logs of what's happening on an endpoint. As an example of a network tap, this is what they look like. You put in the wire on one side, going to the switch and the other side going back out to the firewall and then it makes a copy of that traffic in both directions here and then you can put that into a security onion box a packet capture device whatever it is that you want that's one way of doing it switches can also just make a copy of traffic and basically send it out as well from there from that kind of output we of course can then generate the same logs that we talked about we can send our traffic to a packet capture device we can send it to a tool like Zeek and record transaction data for all of our application layer information, or at a minimum, maybe we just take and we make flow logs out of it, right? Uh, sometimes these devices will directly make NetFlow, so your switches, your routers, and all that kind of stuff could make NetFlow directly, uh, whether it's NetFlow or one of the other styles, we'll call it flow logs. The logs are going to be then generally centralized into a tool called a SIM. And the SIM is the primary place the analysts are going to be logging in to look at the logs that were collected. Now remember, logs are text and a SIM only deals in text. They can't generally pick up PCAP, but we can take PCAP and we can turn it into transaction data with Zeek. And so with something like Zeek or NetFlow, we can turn all of that into logs of traffic. And now all of our information is in here. We also may have security monitoring tools like an EDR. Let's say we have EDR, Endpoint Detection and Response. EDR is a tool that deploys little agents on all of your devices and it checks, does anything here look like it might be part of a compromise? If it is, it's going to be sending logs from here back to your EDR. And then the EDR is going to be sending that information ultimately to your SIM. What we end with is all of our network traffic described in log format, in text format that can be put into a SIM, all of our actual logs from all of our devices, whether they're cloud-based logs uh, from software as a service kind of services, or whether they are logs of what's going on in Amazon with something like CloudTrail, or if it's just flow logs coming from AWS or Azure or GCP or any of those things. Ultimately, all of our data comes in either as full packet capture, and then from there we can turn it into transaction data. All of that largely gets put into a SIM. Now from these security tools, we have certain things that can occur that are of interest to us. And we're trying to say like, what does an attack look like, right? Maybe going to a specific malicious domain name or something like that uh, would be an item that we wanna watch out for. We download from our threat intelligence sources a bunch of bad domains, right? So we're gonna say threat intel is given to these two tools and then all of that information is collected in there. From these, what we might spit out is some kind of alert. And alerts are where you will live as a security analyst. 
you will be watching for all of this data collection. You will be watching for all of these tools to be identifying things that might be attacks. And hopefully they're accurate, but we know false positives are a big issue in a lot of security operations centers. But we tune our tools with analytics and, and say, watch for these specific conditions to try to highlight when things are bad. You also may go out and just search through these logs in a more unstructured kind of proactive way. And that's threat hunting, but that's a totally different video. We're talking about just reacting to things that look like they might be bad. Those alerts are then going to be triaged. So we have our analysts here and our analysts are going to be looking at the alert pile and they're going to be doing triage and they're going to be picking out items they think are most likely to be the most dangerous. Hopefully that's an easy thing to do. And from there, if things are a true positive, call that TP, we are then going to say, we have an issue here. Someone is infected, there is an attack underway. We are going to start up an incident and IR has to begin. So incident response is our next phase. So when we go into incident response, typically we are taking those alerts and the detail that we have about them and putting them into an incident management system. You also may call this a SERP, a security incident response platform. The acronym doesn't matter. It's where you're taking the detailed notes as you do. Sometimes analysts do incident response. Sometimes it's a separate team. Uh, people do triage and a different team does incident response. It all kind of depends on the size of the organization. But this is largely what you're going to be dealing with as an analyst. You're going to be looking at network data that came in. You're going to be looking at logs from all of the devices, whether they're cloud-based devices, endpoints, or security appliances, or network appliances. All of those things are going to come into the SOC. And once they get into the SOC, you're going to be monitoring for stuff that might be bad based on threat intelligence, based on what you've seen in the past. All of those things are going to get identified and spit out as alerts into one of your tools. Your tools are then going to give you some more context. You're gonna do an investigation and see, is this really bad or was it a false detection? If it is really bad, you're going to spin up incident response. Once you get into the incident response phase, it's a whole different game and probably a topic for a different video. But in short, what you try to do when something is infected is you go through a phase of containment. You try to stop the bleeding and make sure it doesn't get any worse. You go through a phase of eradication kicking out the attacker from the environment. Then you go to a recovery phase where you return the network back to the way it was and all of the devices that were affected. And then of course you close it all up with a lessons learned meeting. You get some feedback and you make sure that sort of thing never happens again. So as an analyst, you live in these tools. You are tasked with making sure that nothing bad occurs, but we know that things will occur. So when they do occur, you also have to learn how to contain and eradicate and recover from those issues. It's a really, really exciting job and one that I encourage everyone to try out at some point in an InfoSec career because you will learn a lot very, very quickly. So there you go. That is how a security operations center works, a quick whirlwind tour overview, but I hope it was useful to those of you who were looking to maybe step into a cybersecurity and specifically a security operations role. So there you have it, a quick overview of how a SOC works. Now, obviously I could go into way more detail on this, and this is just a brief overview of some of the tools and technologies we use, but I wanted to squeeze it into a uh, appropriately short video. If you're interested in taking a much, much longer five-day version of this kind of training, we have SEC 450 Blue Team Fundamentals, which is my SANS course, available at sans.org. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, tell a friend about it, help me spread the word. Uh, hit subscribe if you wanna know about all the other upcoming days and I will see you on the next episode. Thanks everyone.